Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Orthopaedic Academy teaching session, which is also being streamed by our partners, Ortho TV. My name is Nikki Evans, and I will be your host. Tonight, I am joined by Mr. Kartik Iyengar um, and Ashok from Ortho TV. Um, Mr. David Hughes will be joining us shortly as well. So this evening, we will have a lecture on non-union and bone defects by Mr. Ainger, followed by three MCQ questions to check your understanding. These are anonymous, so please answer promptly, and then we'll talk through the answers with you. If you have any questions during the lecture, please write them in the chat box, and we will ask Ms. Ainger at the end of the MCQs. We will offer three Viva spaces this evening, so please put in the chat if you would like to take part. Um, and we'll select the first three candidates. The Vivas will not be recorded, and this is an excellent opportunity for you to practice answering your questions in a mock Viva format. For those people that are interested, um, we do run several courses throughout the year, including our intensive mock Viva course and our two new courses, which are a case-based discussions course for orthopedic exams and a basic sciences course uh, we, um, all the details and booking can be found on our website, orthopedicacademy.co.uk. This session will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in the next few days. So don't panic if you miss part of it or you want to revise it. Our invited speaker this evening is a consultant orthopedic surgeon in the northwest of the UK and he's a member of the Faculty of Surgical Trainers <coughs> of Edinburgh. Um, an honorary senior clinical lecturer at the University of Liverpool and Edge Hill University. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce a dear colleague and friend, Mr. Kartik Ayenja. Hi, everyone. My name is Kartik. Uh, I work in a place called Southport. Originally, I'm from India. So uh, welcome to everyone here in the UK and across the world. So today I'm going to talk uh, on non-union of fractures and we'll talk a bit briefly on bone defects. Uh, it's an interesting topic. Uh, I like it. Uh, it is the VIVA table I take in my FRCS VIVA courses. Uh, uh, and let's, uh, let's take it from there. So the learning objectives we'll try to look at today are these. Uh, we'll try to uh, define uh, uh, what's a non-union. We'll try to uh, look at the classifications. How do we evaluate non-unions? What are the options of treatment? Uh, of algorithm, I've made my own uh, brief one, albeit so. Uh, then I will discuss some cases and then we can have a chat about it. And then I have put up a slide where you can have some reference articles if you want to look into it. So let's go to what is a traditional queries in a talk. So why, what, what is a non? That's what I want to know. Why does it happen? What are the risk factors? How do you classify them? And uh, how do you, when you have diagnosed non union, how do you go about managing it? So we will look into all of this. So these are a couple of cases I want you to think about while we uh, uh, go through the talk. We will discuss uh, this in the end. The first one is the eight-year-old with the background history of diabetes. And she fell, which is a common fracture nowadays, uh, is a distal femur. And you can see the fixation and obviously you can see uh, the non-union there. And so the thought process is, how do we manage this? The same, this is a bit more complex uh, as speech patients uh, live longer now, we are getting all of these complicated problems, but here there is a, a, a further complication. The patient has a failure of implant, infected non-union, and therefore, what do we do? 
so uh, we will have a have a have a chat later as to how we can uh, process these conditions so looking at the a definition so when i ask my candidates there is a couple of definitions they do but these are the three which i have found consistently that i think we should refer to so the F fda in uh, usa has defined a non union uh, as a fracture which is at least 9 months old and has not showed any progression of healing over three consecutive months radiologically clinically it's a symptomatic fracture with no apparent potential to heal without intervention so there two words are important here so it's a symptomatic fracture and it's unlikely to heal without surgical intervention and the other commonly used uh, definition can be it's uh, one which takes double the amount of what is normal for a fracture to heal but if i ask you okay define what's a definition the upper two are the ones i'm looking for all all these have traditional risk factors these are quoted uh, uh, extensively we all know about systemic factors uh, including comorbidities i'll come to that and most important is when you're managing non union is looking at the local factors so what's the type of fracture personality was was compound open what was was the fixation adequate or not when you manage uh, is there a, a bone defect how do we address bone defect what's a bone a critical bone defect so we will look into it most importantly don't forget the neurovascular structure and the soft tissue this will all come as we assess the patient and have devise an algorithm how do you manage these patients so so there are multiple comorbidities these are the five i want you to look into because this for a higher order a higher order marking in frc saw for 7 and 8 it's not just good enough oh yes the risk factors are diabetes smoking etc i want you to understand why diabetes patients are at a high risk why smoking is a well defined factor we need to look at at micro uh, microscopic level biological level why we can so let me uh, expand on few of this so this is uh, uh, diabetes so if uh, if uh, if the person asks you across the table okay uh, diabetes is a risk factor i know but please explain and highlight how this happens so a traditionally patient with uh, a diabetes these are the mechanisms how uh, it leads to a uh, risk of non union you need to talk about age you need to talk about ros and most importantly is that it initiates a process where patients are at a high risk of osteoporosis they have uh, a lot of uh, free radicals at the fracture site which are not conducive to healing in fact they have significant amount of pro inflammatory uh, mediators and as you all know these all patients are at an increased risk of infections as well so that adds to the spectrum of non union so there is a reference i have quoted at the bottom if you look at it patients who have diabetics have three times the incidence so that's the number you need to quote that's three times uh, likely for having non union delayed union or wound complication in fact it has a seven fold increase uh, risk of uh, fold increase in risk of hip fractures and more uh, about 1.5 times in type 2 uh, diabetes let's look at smoking now same uh, same mechanism uh, similar mechanism but the same structure i am trying to uh, elucidate here smoking predominant uh, is the relation is vascularity nicotine is a vasoconstrictor constrictor it increases the local carbon monoxide levels it counters the uh, antioxidant properties of vitamin c and e and this all leads to an environment which is not conducive to bone healing it also affects the preliminary stages of fracture healing itself so if i have quoted a couple of references there those are i would suggest take home read them there are two systematic reviews Uh, one is by Bridget Scammell. You will know from Oxford. And characteristically, characteristically, if you are asked, okay, how what is the risk of uh, smoking-related non-union? 
should I be able to quote this one or two of these papers? Say, okay, it's twice more likely to have non-unions, uh, two times more, especially in tibia and long bone fractures. Vitamin D is another component and how that's what we need to learn. We need to understand vitamin D acts at all levels of fracture healing. That is the five levels, whether it's at the inflammatory stage, hematoma stage, formation of the soft callus, hard callus, and even remodeling. And also, where vitamin D is important from wound healing point of view. So these are the three key factors and risk factors I want you to understand a bit, develop a bit more uh, info on it when you when when you are across the table in a YY situation. Let's look at the concepts. So there are few theories and concepts as to why non-union happens. Uh, I am sure you guys already must have read about Perrin's theory and Wolf's theory. But what I am going to focus on for a couple, the theory of mechanobiology. So union is a uh, is an interplay between biology and mechanical stability. For the fracture to heal, both should work in tandem. If one of them is missing, this relationship is disturbed. And hence, this is the concept that one expects you to know, a theory of mechanobiology. However, at uh, the FRCS level, this is the concept everyone keeps talking about. Uh, diamond concept is the concept of uh, two people. So if you need to know two people in the world who have done extensive work on non-union is these two people. Geonadi's professor from Leeds and Professor Calori from uh, Italy. They devised this concept as to look out for what are the reasons that the fractures heal and why these elements are critical, uh, critically important uh, in fracture healing. If you look at it, it has got all the uh, four components. It's got three biological components and a one feature suggestive of mechanical stability. So the biology, and if you can uh, uh, look at the figure on the right, stem cells, these are essential for osteogenic. Matrix, organic matrix is important for osteoconduction. Uh, and growth factors, which are important for osteoinduction, so remember, these are the three key criteria which we use while we are talking about bone grafts as well, isn't it? So that therefore, these three key factor, biological elements, but supported by the importance of mechanical stability, that's what it comes with fixation, but the biological three factors are important for uh, fracture healing. The significance of this is what they feel as they develop this concept is for a fracture to heal, you need to have all of these working in tandem. Deficiency of one or the other uh, or a combination of other leads and it's a risk factor for non-union. Let me show you for the other one. So though the biological concept of diamond concept was initiated in about say 2008 or so, this has been rightly emphasized now with the Pentagon regenerative concept. What it is trying to say is, I think why uh, vascular uh, supply is key. So apart from the four elements of the diamond, the element that has been included now is vascularization because that's the key element where the blood supply, all the elements that are required to uh, achieve healing are initiated. So here, uh, this, uh, Pentagon concept is the current concept that we need to quote. Diamond is good, but Pentagon is a step further than that. Looking at classifications, so these are the two classifications I would like you to quote across the table. Everybody is aware of Weber and Sheck, but non-union scoring system is the hot topic. So let's talk about the traditional one. So this is a traditional uh, classification we all, all describe. Uh, however, we are talking about hypertrophic atrophic here. And this was discovered and uh, developed by two uh, surgeons, Weber from Switzerland and uh, Zek from uh, Prague. They looked at x-rays and this is basically a radiological classification, looking at the biology at the ends of the bone. So if you can see on the left, it's hypertrophic, 
and the right is atrophic. How is this relevant? Classically, hypertrophic uh, non-unions show a lot of bone formation. However, the key problem here is mechanical instability. Hence, if you fix the mechanical instability, the fracture should go on to heal. However, on the atrophic side, the element that is missing is biology. There, mechanical stabilization won't help. So you need to include, induce uh, bone formation for achieving uh, the healing. So why do we need a new scoring system? We traditionally uh, widely use Weber and Sec, hypotrophic, uh, atrophic, very easy to describe. What, as with any classifications, there were uh, factors which needed to be improved on the old uh, Weber and Sec. Uh, classification are necessary for you to uh, communicate across and therefore these had to be strengthened. So uh, this concept of new classification came into uh, woe in about 2008, 2009, around that time. And also again by two people, uh, Professor Gionardis and uh, Calori, and they have emphasized the three key elements that, that are required. So one is the bone, the soft tissue, and third, third is the patient factors. So let's look at these. So this is a busy site, but th this is what I could get. Very good article, please refer to it. So they uh, mark and give marks or score each element that patient uh, are assessed. This, this includes clinical examination, uh, imaging factors, patient the general itself, ASA grades, et cetera. And also what is the scoring of the, of the patient and x-rays on uh, Weber set classification. All of these are scored and you come to a number. When you come to a number, they are again reclassified into four groups. And one slide I would like you guys to take home is this, because this makes your algorithm and management quite straightforward and understanding. It. So if after the NUS scoring system, a patient scores, uh, scores between zero to 25, it's a stra straightforward non-union, similar to the hypotrophic one. And if you improve the mechanical instability by re revisiting the fixation, the fracture should go on to unite. Second one is the middle one, where both biology and mechanics is at fault. These patients are scoring between 26 to 50. So in along with improving the mechanical stability, you have to induce biological stimulation. This could be due to various uh, modalities. You can use pulse, electro, uh, pulse uh, electronic uh, magnetic field. You can use extra uh, corporeal shock wave therapy or the traditional biotechnologies like BMP, growth factors, et cetera, and et cetera. When you come to the third group, that's where it becomes a bit more complicated. These patients have both mechanical and biological insufficiency, but along with this, predominantly these patients tend to have infection. With this, they have a problem of bone defect as well. So you have to manage multiple things here. You have to manage the patient, you have to manage the fracture, but along with this, you have to manage the infection. And then after you have taken or resected the part of infected bone, you need to start understanding how you are going to organize the bone defect to be filled. So there are various methods where you can apply uh, to uh, uh, achieve the bone defect mechanism. You can have bone transport, uh, pr transport mechanism. Mascale is well, uh, well talked about. And the newer one, which I think is being talked about is the RIA system. Reamer irrigator and aspirator works well in femur, not much in tibia and the traditional biologics, which are the scaffolds, growth factors, and et cetera. Coming to the fourth one, if a patient is scoring seven, more than 75, the patient is host type C. In that, they have significant comorbidities. Patient's condition, local and general, is very poor. The size of the defect is so large that trying to undertake what we could undertake uh, in, in, in the third group is literally uh, not going to work. So probably they, they are the candidates for amputation, arthrodesis, or consider a complete resection and use a megaprosthesis. 
after you have diagnosed or classified, how do we uh, assess radiological union? So this is the first article, which was by Bhandari et al, where they established a scoring system to evaluate union across TBL fractures after internal fixation. So they scored, uh, uh, they again had a point for scoring uh, to assess three-dimensional uh, healing. So if you look at uh, bone as a three-dimensional concept. It has got four cortices. So if you see no callus in any of the four cortices, then you get one point each. So you can have a minimum of four and a maximum of 16. If you look at the second uh, figure, there is some callus uh, seen, but you can still see the fracture line. So they score two. If there is a bridging callus, uh, this, uh, uh, but the fracture line is slightly still visible. Again, it's a, a similar score. If you have a fracture which has healed with bridging callus, no fracture lines healed, that is, that is three. So you count and multiply this with all the four cortices and look at whether the fracture is healing. I have recently looked, this is being applied to humeral fractures. This is being applied to femur fracture. Uh, article got published uh, last week please have a look. So they, people have started to extrapolate the rust classification score, uh, fracture scoring uh, union scale into other fractures, humerus, femur, and probably this will come more and more popular. How do you assess patients? Apart from your tra traditional ways of looking or assessing a patient of look, feel, and move, looking for scars, sinuses, feeling for pain, obviously for testing mobility, Always check for joints above because uh, above and below because this has an effect on management of the field. Neurovascular, don't forget. But these are the three percentages that uh, uh, you can quote uh, and the sensitivity and specificity of the, each of these factors. You can look at inability to bear weight carries the significant uh, clinical way of judging by taking a history and tenderness on palpation is about 35 to 40 percent imaging. I can give a whole talk on imaging for fracture healing and non-union, but I made it concise as to what are the traditional modalities of these. All the modalities have their own place uh, in evaluation of non-union. Plain radiograph, the commonest one, the first one, it gives you the whole character of the fracture story, fracture journey that it's good. You can know what was the type of injury? You can know how was the pattern of injury. You can, you can look at the healing effort, callus formation, previous implants, how they have got. However, more, more and more CT is being uh, uh, used to evaluate bridging callus. Especially you can apply maybe extension of the rust classification. It is useful in looking at patients who have hardware near intraarticular fractures, looking at rotational deformities and uh, limb length discrepancy, because this is common with infected non -union. you get that. MRI has not that much role, but it is, it, it's used more around joint replacement other things. PET and scintigraphy is significant uh, uh, in that you can look PET CT using glucose, looks at the metabolism that is going on around the non-union and fracture site. And apparently it is useful in knowing the level of resection when you want to go in. So if you do a PET scan, you can look at the uh, metabolic activity and know where the activity is there, where there is none, and probably can mark your level of uh, resection rather than under resection uh, of the fractures. So this is a ladder which I keep in mind uh, when I have been given an X-ray or something to debate. So first classify, define non-union, confirm why it is non-union and describe the X-ray or the pathology. Then decide, More, most key I would suggest is to know whether it's an infective or a non-infective one, apply your NUSS criteria, then you have an algorithm. And obviously, if you have a bone defect coming into the uh, level, uh, type, level three, then you will know what other options that you need to talk about. You anticipate what are the questions that you that is going to. So this is one other key element that I think you need to uh, keep in mind. So polytherapy is when we combine all the fundamental uh, uh, 
principle which have we have in our armory, including uh, the which involve the diamond concept. You need to get uh, the, your scaffold uh, factors. You need to get growth factors. You need to get osteoprogenites. All these, including the mechanical steroid, is called polytherapy. Usually, traditionally used in the third group between the uh, 51 to 75 scoring on NUSS. Let's talk, let me talk briefly uh, on uh, bone defects. I've not put many slides of it. The key here element I wanted to uh, learn when I was reading about is uh, the concept of critical bone defect. So you know you have a bone defect if you have an infected non-union or a non-infected one, but how do you classify that? Which, which bone defects should you, uh, uh, maybe autologous bone graft, which do you need some larger techniques uh, or uh, vascularized, fibrolized or not? So this is a definition commonly asked, critical bone defect. So what's a critical bone defect? It's a defect where you know after resection or after non-union that you are left with a gap. And if you leave it as that, it's not going to heal. So if the definition is passed, However, I have found out any uh, gap non-union that is more than 2.5 centimeter is called a critical bone defect. So if you have a patient who has a non-union, whether infective or non-infective, and the gap is more than 2.5, then surgical intervention is required. I looked at a bit more to look at traumatic bone defect classification. This is a new one that has come back. Very nice classification is given makes things very clear. So if you look at the incomplete defects, these are less than two centimeters. They are unicortical or bicortical losses. And as we go on to defects, which are uh, uh, less than two centimeters with some uh, deformity and obliquity of the fracture site, they are D2. But the critical one that uh, is difficult to treat are the treatments where this critical bone defects is more than 2 to 2.5 centimeter. You can have some which are less than 4, major are when they are between 4 to 8 centimeter and massive defects uh, which are more than 8 centimeter. Why do we need to do that? Because you can plan the management accordingly. If it is a massive defect more than 8 centimeter, then probably you need uh, distractant or osteogenesis. If you have a, de a defect which is two to four centimeter, maybe you can get away with mascule or a few vascularized fibular graft. So this is important. First, establish whether the defect is critical or not. And if it is critical, uh, start thinking whether you need to uh, uh, do something else about it. So that's uh, algorithm. Again, I keep coming back to algorithm. Define non-union, establish whether it's infective or non-infective. Decide whether you have a bone defect, which is critical or not. And depending whether it's critical or not, you can do traditional bone grafting. Or if you are, it is critical, then you need some more uh, instruments in your armatory. So again, challenge infective bone graft is a different uh, uh, topic altogether. Significant challenges, including diagnosis, knowing the organisms, imaging strategies, completely different different uh, uh, spectrum of this. Again, I come back to this slide. Learn biology. For the fracture to heal, not to go into non-union, need to have two concepts. One is the biology, second is the stability. So if you need the biology, you need the three elements of that. Osteoinduction, osteoconduction, and osteogenic modality is there. So let's go back to our patient. So this is, uh, I know her, she's 80, diabetic, uh, had this fracture and um, you can see from the fracture fixation itself, it's the, it is insufficient. You can see there is a virus mal, uh, mal, uh, um, uh, angulation at the fracture side. The proximal screws are backing out. This is insufficient. However, the critical factor I can see from the X-ray itself it has neither the callus formation at the fracture site, nor is the implant stable. So therefore, this uh, probably comes in the uh, uh, second level of NUSS 25 to 50, where both biology is poor and stability is poor. So how do you go about this? Confirm there is no infection and then see what we did. 
So we have restored the mechanical stability with the locking plate, but look, see, we have used dual plating because that gives a three-dimensional stability at the fracture site. We have included the whole of the lateral pad. We have supported the stem at the top. And obviously we added bone graft and she has recovered very well, fully independently mobile. And that's the, that's, that's, that probably should have been the first uh, choice of treatment. So let's look at this one. This is a complex one. These are the x-rays I got from my friend uh, and I should thank him for it. So this is a lady who's 74, had a fracture nearly a couple of years back. The first figure is the one where they plated it, but she ended up in an emergency situation with the fracture on the first. So obviously you can see now that she has a broken plate, classical non-union <clears throat> with a, a wound infection. So this is infective, non-union, periprosthetic, distal to the stem. But when you try to go in and resect that bone part, you are left with a big void. So this void is significant. So how do you fill that? So the coming to the filling of this, you can see that this is a two-stage procedure where you have excised uh, the infected bone, temporarily stabilized with a kunshad nail sort of picture and significant amount of antibiotic-loaded cement. Antibiotic-loaded cement gives a significantly good uh, elution of antibiotics at a lo lo uh, local level controls the infection. Luckily, the infective organism was trapped. Therefore, it worked very well. So that's the X-ray few, few weeks down the line. You can see there is some, uh, some uh, uh, orientation of the fracture site. And this is the second stage. So this is a custom-made uh, custom prosthesis, not available, I know, at all center, but these are difficult fractures to uh, treat. So you got a custom-made uh, prosthesis with uh, a proximal stem uh, where extension, where you can have the stem fitting in, in the custom made implant itself. And then there is a flange on the outer side, which is supporting the stem on the outer side. Distally, man we managed to save the femoral condyle, but these are complex uh, 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 injuries, difficult to treat, but these are the, uh, what I'm trying to say is a way of treating, understanding and applying that for you. So if you are asked in a paper, okay, tell me a paper. So this is a mnemonic I made. This is what the way. So it's peak of. So this is a general information. If you guys need to uh, say you are put on a spot. Okay, tell me about a recent paper. So this is the way I go into say, uh, learning this. So this can be your template. Classically, if you look at it, it says the learning resources. But believe me, if you Google or PubMed, both calorie and geonadis, you will get most of the articles that you need to know on non-union. There are a couple of uh, articles I have squeezed in there because I did master's in nuclear medicine and therefore I have, I have uh, published a couple of them. Please have a look at it. Uh, and if you need any, please let me know. I can send it across. And probably that's where I will thank you all guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kartik. That was um, <clears throat> excellent, very useful talk. And I'm sure that everybody that's listening will have learned something, um, you know, and some good tips for the exam as well as for your um, practice. So I've noticed there's a couple of questions um, which I've written down. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to launch the MCQ. So there's just three MCQ questions. Um, it's anonymous, so if you just answer them as soon as you can, and then we'll talk through the answers, and then we'll move on to the questions. Shall we take it on? So 100%. So let's look at the first one. If you look at the first one, this is what I uh, put it up on my definition uh, uh, slide, isn't it? Uh, definition of non-union FDA is a uh, fracture which has taken at least nine months or with no signs of radiological progression of healing or a symptomatic fracture with no parent potential to heal or a fracture which has taken twice. So the first one is incorrect. Good, 70%, uh, nearly 70% have 
answered correctly. That's a good number. So let's look at smoking and non-union. Correct. You got the key element that I pointed out. That smoking, remember twice, two, two, two. So twice the, uh, the, uh, the, the more likely to develop non-union, tibia, and twice the number of uh, in any fracture. So if you are asked for that, remember two, two, two. Right, that's good. Uh, let's all, uh, right. So NUSS score 30, yeah, they come into the second group. Remember where I suggested that you need mechanical and biological. So you, that, uh, you revisit your mechanical stability and then you have to enhance uh, biology, isn't it? So what can you do? Uh, you can do the uh, pulse electric ma magnetic field. Yes, 69. Antibiotic therapy has no role uh, in the classification system of NUSS. Mega prosthesis, as we said, are for patients who are more than 75 in NUSS 4. In their patients who have significant comorbidities, type C host, and mascale is required for number, uh, group three, where they're scoring between 50 to 75. So uh, less than uh, zero to 25 stability, hypertrophic predominantly union. So improve the stability, biology is already there. 26 to 50, we need uh, uh, improved stability or better stability and improve your um, uh, improve the biology, which you can do with multiple uh, levels, and then pulse electric uh, magnetic, uh, and and the third one where you have a defect infected non-union, and fourth is where it's more than. So someone uh, put it on the chat. They wanted to know a new SS uh, score again. Shall four groups easy, four groups so divide into four groups. How do you get to a score with uh, score is, is the slide before. So there are three, this, uh, this is a busy slide I know, but each of the elements which re, uh, are risk factors or predictors of non-union are given a score. In the end, all these are calculated and you come to a core number. So when you come to a core number, you have a patient say, okay, the patient has a, a score of anywhere between 0 to 25. So these patients traditionally have, uh, biology is good, but they have mechanical instability. So if you, if you establish stability, then they are going to go to heat. Patients who are scoring between 26 to 50 have probably both a problem. So therefore, you integrate your mechanical stability, but enhance biology by various modes. You can use pulse uh, uh, electromagnetic field. You can use extra short wave, uh, uh, short wave corporal shock wave therapy. You can use biologics, uh, anything that is possible. When you come to the third group, which are scoring between 51 to 75, these are more complex. My more complex, these are probably patients who have infective non -union. These are patients who will develop a bone defect. And therefore, you are now landed up with a problem of infection plus bone defect. So you have to address all this. So how do you address this? Obviously, you need stability, but you need to organize things to heal by getting uh, a, a, a bone defect healed up. So there are various techniques for this. So techniques can be mascale you know, or induced me membrane technique, which uh, they have quoted nearly 80% healing uh, of non-unions. Remember, even with all these uh, techniques, nearly 20% of uh, non-unions don't go on to heal. Uh, then you have the newer uh, modality called RA RIA system, well described in literature, again from Prof and Leeds. Please have a look at it. And all this is called, so you have to get the three key biological elements of healing. That includes osteogenesis, osteoinduction, and osteoconduction. So that's why this all therapy is jointly called as polytherapy. And obviously, if the patient is scoring more than 75, 
it comes into the last group where the host itself has, is in host C group, significant comorbidities where any reconstructive surgery is going to be more detrimental than considering a salvage procedure. So did you I, all guys get that? I'll stop sharing. Okay, Mohammed, I hope that um, helped. Um, Mohammed had another question. I wasn't sure whether it was a, a question, Mohammed, or, or whether it was a statement. Um, you've written why dual plating, distal femur, LCP, and bone graft would have done the job. Um, yes, the thought process is uh, both at uh, distal and proximal. Subprochantric, the Liverpool concept is if you have a subprochantric non union, you know, traditionally use a nail to do a non union, but they end up nearly 20% end up in non union. Liverpool has a low uh, um, threshold dual plate. Why? Because plating, you can give you a good angular stability in maybe in one plate, but you know, subprochantric, the proximal fragment always tends to flex up. So you, if you have fixed it laterally, that tends, therefore they just put a neutralizing sort of picture so that you get integrity in four. The similar concept may be in the distal femur as well. See, remember that distal uh, uh, fragment in uh, distal femur flexes, isn't it? Because the hamstring gastro are attached, uh, attached there. So the gastro pulls it down. So you get a lateral AP line uh, stability with your lateral plating. But if you want to do it in the AP plate, uh, in the anteroposterior plate, probably dual plating. You may get away with a single plating, but that encompasses everything. You come out of it and you know it's going to be stable. That's great. Thanks, Kartek. It's one of those, uh, I want to go to bed and don't call me operations. So, <laughs> you know, and then I've got a question from Norman. Norman has asked, what is the definition of delayed union? So delayed union is any fracture which has taken longer than the traditional amount of time that it is required to heal and is at a risk of non-union. So delayed union can be anything, say for example, tibia, three to four months. So if it is taking and you are checking at six, six months, still not healing, but it's not at the time where it is becoming a non-union. Probably it may end up in healing in the next month. So that is delayed union. So traditionally longer than normally it takes a fracture to heal, but not as long as a non-union. Non-union is a fracture where it won't heal. It's unlikely to heal without intervention. That could be intervention surgically or by non-surgical like uh, pulse, electric, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thank you. I hope that answered your question, uh, Norman. And mohammed has got another question. Um, what's the role of Elizaroff in non-union? Is it a good device to address the non-unions? Yes, very well established before the Mascale and the uh, uh, newer techniques of REAM, uh, RIA, but there is a limitation maybe on how much uh, length you can achieve. Maybe say it is good, say, Drawer palace article it says about eight to five eight to fifteen centimeter. However, remember, all the distraction osteogenesis Elizarov have long rehabilitation. They have to wear that frame for ages. Lot of pin side problems. So therefore, patients' compliance is also difficult. But believe me, Elizarov external fixator, ring fixator are a marvelous uh, way of trying to heal, especially defect and infective and non-infective defect unions. We use that traditional in India. Uh, Royal Liverpool has a very good uh, Elizara unit and it requires a dedicated unit, a dedicated team, patient compliance. And remember, they do well with tibial fractures, not in femur. Femur is a no-no for Elizara because lots of complications. Thank, thanks, Karthik. And I've got a question from Mohammed. Um, a different Mohammed. Uh, would you consider an IM nail and plate rather than dual plating? Yes, but remember, if you are using two modalities of techniques, so IM nail is taking your industrial bed supply off, plating is taking your 
periosteal blood supply. I know there are fractures nowadays where they're advocating uh, retrograde nailing and a stabilizing plate. Yes, you can. You need to get stabilization, whichever way. So if you are going down, you open uh, the fracture side itself, lateral baiting you have done, you put simply put an anterior plate. You are there, aren't you? Otherwise, you take go ahead with a different construct, different element. And remember that I am nailed, they had put, had failed, isn't it? So once burnt, maybe use a, set, a different technique, which works well in your hand. I think that's the way forward. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, one more question, um, and then we'll move on to Viva. So again, it's Mohammed. What's the protocol in UK to treat infected non-union? It's a big subject. So all the regions have a dedicated limb recon unit. So that, that's where most of these patients do get. So DGS is a difficult. So if you if you are in trouble, if you have scored, so NUS system is to know a non-speciality clinic when to refer. So if you have see a patient, you have fixed state, six months, nine months down the line, you're scoring 25, 50, then you know you are heading for a non-unit seek early uh, uh, advice from them. You can communicate with them, listen, I have this. And they are very good at dealing with this because they have a system in place. So obviously when they are seen in their clinic, they have a non-union clinics, you know, Royal Leopoldus, well-established non-union clinic every Friday. Go there, you'll see a spectrum of patients. They have a system of assessment, they have a system of imaging, they have a system of uh, getting uh, the organisms, it requires an MDT meeting, the microbiologists are involved because they have varied uh, organisms. Some uh, require more medical input because they are diabetic, unstable diabetes, etc. So you need an MDT approach. You need a limb recon unit. You need someone who does this regularly. You need an MDT input. You need to have a team of physiotherapists and rehab specialists to look after because pin sides and looking after the frame is key element. Thanks, Kartik. Yeah, I think, I'm not sure where you work, Mohammed, but um, I certainly work in a DDH and, and infected non-unions for us, or, you know, infected joint replacements, everything seems to be a lot more centralized in the UK. Um, so if you have any kind of problem, uh, there's usually a regional centre that you can refer to or at least discuss the cases with and send over the um, radiographs and things. So for anyone that's doing the FRCS exam, um, a key thing to say in these questions is MDT approach, regional centre, um, and that will tick marks off for you and it shows that you're safe um, for the purposes of, well, if you're working in the UK, yes, but for the purposes of the exam, it's important that you say those things. Okay, that's great. So we finished the questions. I am going to stop the recording and we'll move on to the vivers.